Okay, so let's continue our models of explanation. Uh, so what happens in this models of code? Um, so this is an old code where I've uh, had in the, in the same M file everything. Mm, not the best uh, programming style, maybe. I got some feedback on that. But anyway, it's, it's all here. So first of all, to avoid inverse crime, we do a very fine resolution signal, as we did in this year as well. Uh, uh, a point spread function is constructed and here we do a convolution at a high resolution to get the higher resolution uh, target. Then uh, here we choose the dimension of our unknown in the computational model. Um, we construct the same point spread function on that resolution. Here is the measurement matrix where I think I'm doing some kind of uh, shape, yeah, so that it, it, it becomes a square matrix. Then uh, we make interpolation from the fine grid signal and add some noise as we did this year as well. And then these are just the uh, high resolution plot functions to show in the plot. So then mm, <clears throat> we take the singular value decomposition. Uh, uh, we pick out the R value, which is the last uh, greater than zero singular value. Uh, in computational reality, it's often uh, good to use some kind of tolerance. I mean, in MATLAB, of course, there, there is a, really something like, like a zero, but with floating point numbers, a small enough point, like the machine epsilon is something to 10 to the power of minus 16 or something like that. So at least smaller than that, is usually good to think as zero. So here I just made a threshold of 10 to the minus 10 to say that anything smaller than that is practically zero. Um, and here I'm doing finding the zero in that f, f function in a very simple way. I mean you could do something more reasonable like a Newton method for example for, for root finding for an equation. Here I just do something very simple um, so <clears throat> I construct this uh, M prime like in the theory mm. here I compute uh, the minimum and maximum for the assumption we had remember we had uh, uh, okay Remember this one, uh, there was a norm of M as a maximum and norm of projected M uh, as a minimum. And the projection should be to the subspace co-kernel of the, the matrix A. And what how do we do that? So actually the uh, projection to the co-kernel is the rest of the elements in, in the matrix M prime uh, corresponding to those singular values that are zero. That's how to pick out that part. So then uh, we are actually checking for the assumption here that our no noise level should be between these values, as the theorem says. Uh, and, and if we go through this, this one, uh, then we should, we should be sure that there's a unique zero for the function we are looking at. And then uh, this is the simple, simple and naive way of looking for the zero. I'm just, I'm just taking a lot of uh, a, quite a fine evaluation grid and I just evaluate our function at all of those points. So 
So here you see uh, the function So we are looking for the zero of this function right here. And here is the first term and the second term. And then we are subtracting the noise level squared. So that's the function. And it's extremely simple. I just evaluated in so many points and then Here I'm just taking the minimum of the evaluation point indices that, that still has uh, the function greater than zero. Very primitive. I'm sorry for all the numerical analysts out there. This is so, so naive. One could, of course, do a, a Newton method or something more reasonable. which actually was uh, an exam problem some of these years. Who knows, it might be again. We'll know later today. And then, so then we have the alpha. Or I seem to call it delta here. Well, sorry, the notation <laughs> seems to be different from the book because yeah this code was written before the book so the notation seems to have changed anyway that's how Morozov works any questions oh, okay so it's such a method based on knowing the noise level and this is also for yes this is for Tihonov there are adaptations of this method uh, for total variation, for example, in recent research articles. So it, it has been done. So then let me... <coughs> let me... Uh, show you another one. Let's talk about methods designed for total variation. And here, for total variation, here is a kind of a, a review of, of methods published uh, in the literature. When writing the paper about this resolution-based method, we went through the research literature quite carefully, and actually the referees of our paper were uh, also suggesting several papers we didn't know about. So I think this is a rather complete list of, of uh, works for choosing the total variation regularization parameter. And I think today I will mention the, the S-curve method done in our team and the resolution-based method which I talk about next. In the resolution-based method, uh, like we already mentioned earlier today, uh, so there, there the idea is that in, in the actual measurement model, we have an X-ray machine. We have here some object, which is not discretized at all. I mean, it's an object in the real world. And then we take X-ray images from different directions, and that's the data we get. The data is discretized because we collect it uh, with an actual... Uh, detector, but the object itself uh, is not discretized at this point. So then when we want to make a reconstruction, we need to build the computational model as we have discussed so many times in this course. And for the computational model, we need to discretize. Everything has to be finite for a computer. So we discretize, but however, there is no given resolution for this discretization. We can discretize uh, as uh, in the way we want. And actually, just as a side mention, it is also a regularization method to use a very coarse discretization and reconstruct, because then kind of the low number of pixels will provide some kind of natural regularization. 
And well, it works. I mean, in the extreme, you could think that there's only one pixel. You're looking for just the average value of the unknown. So it's just one number. It's very stable to recover. Uh, however, I would like to promote, instead of that kind of thing using less pixels, uh, I think it would be good for inverse problems methodology to kind of study several resolutions at the same time in, in the way that any reconstruction method could be used at any resolution and there would be convergence when the resolution is refined. For example, if you have studied anything about finite element method, for example, there uh, in solution of, of partial differential equations, a domain is divided into triangles or tetrahedrons. And there's always a theorem saying that when the triangles or tetrahedrons are made smaller and smaller, then the result of the computation will uh, approximate the, the uh, solution of the PD in the continuous world more and more precisely. So somehow in inverse problems, I think it's, it would be good to have a same kind of thing that, that if we repeat kind of the same reconstruction at finer and finer levels of discretization, we would get uh, kind of the same reconstruction more and more accurately or approximate the same limit reconstruction more and more uh, accurately. So, following this kind of thinking, uh, Matti Lassas and I and, and uh, others tried what happens if we compute the total variation norm, total variation regularization at different resolutions and, and demand that the results should be, should be somehow coherent or, or uh, compatible over resolutions. So what we did, we actually used this uh, anisotropic uh, TV first actually because of convenience uh, of, of coding like we saw in this course. It's kind of nice to use this horizontal difference and vertical difference matrix. Then we can use the quadratic programming approach easily and, and stuff like that. In this project it turned out that the proof we made actually also works only for this so-called anisotropic formulation like this. Then uh, we actually have to take this kind of 1 over n term here when we use uh, a discretization of n by n pixels in the, in the unit square. The unit square, well, from 0 to 1 x coordinate, 0 to 1 y coordinate. Uh, so this sum here is taken over both uh, horizontal neighbor pixels and vertical neighbor pixels. So this is kind of a discrete anisotropic total variation penalty term here. Uh, but we need this 1 over n to make the result compatible over resolutions. Why? Uh, let's see. So in the continuum case, in the actual uh, unit square in R2, we are dealing with this kind of a formula. And discreetly we do this. So what is the relationship between these two? So if you look at, for example, the derivative with respect to the x1 variable, and we do a simple uh, difference quotient here for the derivative, and then we discretize the integral by just the simple midpoint rule. So we need the area of a pixel when discretizing the integral. This is the area of the pixel, and this 1 over n here comes from just the difference quotient for, for the discrete derivative or finite difference. So this 1 over n here will cancel one of these 1 over n's here in the two-dimensional case. So that's why it's important to have this here. I emphasize it because in our team now several people have implemented this method and I think every person has first forgotten to put this in. So I try to kind of keep it up. So then, uh, let's look at this method uh, for the walnut data in 2D. So as usual, if we have two small parameter, we start to see some noisiness in the reconstruction. And if we have kind of good alpha value, then we get this total variation type look with roughly piecewise constant things. 
And then if we take too large alpha, then our reconstruction starts to be kind of not so useful. So now let's look at these three alpha choices over resolutions. So for example, here, this is at the, uh, using the too small alpha, and now we compute with uh, a coarse resolution, medium, and finer resolution, and we kind of see that the, the noisiness seems to be increasing when we go to finer resolution. Then here we have alpha to be the so-called good value for, for alpha, and it kind of seems that our reconstruction is, is uh, looking the same regardless of the resolution. So we kind of see the desired uh, convergence towards a limit, maybe. And also for this one, uh, it's a useless reconstruction, but however it seems to be independent of resolution, or somehow there seems to be uh, a well-defined limit for this guy. So now, uh, a little bit similar to the L-curve method, we computed reconstructions with uh, many alpha, starting from small and going, going to bigger ones, so quite a wide range of alpha values, and then we computed for each reconstruction, we computed the reconstruction at the coarse, medium, and fine resolution. So a lot of computations, this is a downside of this approach. We have to compute so many reconstructions. However, uh, if we just do it and then compute the total variation norm of each reconstruction, those are the numbers here. Uh, we see that for two small alpha, the total variation norms of the reconstruction are not the same. So they start to grow because of the noisiness. And then there seems to be this kind of uh, suitable alpha value, in this case one. And then we see that these values are roughly constant, not completely the same, but roughly constant. And it seems to be for all alpha bigger than this threshold value. So somehow the intuition here goes that uh, we take the smallest alpha that still gives stable TV norms for the reconstructions. Stable under changing the resolution. Well, if we add noise, uh, we see a similar story with these reconstructions. And quite intuitively, we see that uh, we have to take a little bit bigger alpha to ensure that these uh, total variation norms stay independent of the resolution. So we have this kind of intuitive thinking here. It seems to work nice. We've tried this for, for uh, many examples, and it seems to work nicely. But there is a, there is a uh, strange thing that we actually can prove. So we wrote this kind of proof uh, considering the continuous case where we are actually working on function spaces, so no discretization involved, and, and using this kind of, this, the, well, the anisotropic uh, TV norm. And then we could prove that actually when we work with the discretized guys and look at the, so these SJ guys are kind of the same functional here, but restricted to the uh, piecewise constant pixelized functions. So actually we could prove that these uh, total variation norms should converge for any choice of alpha. So there is a little bit uh, open question still what is going on in, in our computation here uh, because the theorem says that for any alpha, these numbers should converge. So now the question is, uh, will they converge if we compute with finer and finer resolution? So do we just not yet see the convergence because we are so coarse in resolution still? Or is it so that the ill posedness of the problem prevents us really to compute the actual? So are these numbers wrong, inaccurate, uh, because of numerical instability? We don't know. So, so this method is still a little bit heuristic in that sense. But so far, in many applications, it has been working 
quite nicely. Hmm. So that's something you might want to try in the project work. Maybe it, at least it's it's a possibility uh, to try try these, and then there's also. Or are there any questions before I move to the next method? Oh, the audience is completely confused. That's great. That's the goal of these lectures. Uh, so then I should find... Okay, let me see. Let's see our sparse tomography paper. Oh, maybe actually, maybe actually this one. So this is the so-called S-curve method S for sparsity and Here, the idea is that maybe we have uh, a priori information about uh, some, some uh, so these are actually physically cut, these walnuts. And, uh, well, I must point out, we have an error here because the left and right picture are the same. They should be from different walnuts, but, uh, well, anyway, uh, with the idea that we would have kind of an atlas of of images of walnuts, in this case photographs, kind of to make the case that it's from a different source of information. So we could make, if we have this kind of images for a bunch of walnuts cut in half, we can take the wavelet transform of the photographs and see how many of the wavelet coefficients are non-zero. Again, using some kind of reasonable threshold that, that smaller than like 10 to the minus 10 is is considered to be zero. So then we have uh, an a priori information about how sparse the true object should be in wavelet basis. Having this one number, it's just one number, the percentage of non-zero wavelet coefficients. Then we can, again, we can take a bunch of alpha values, bunch of regularization parameters here in the horizontal line, compute Total variation, oh sorry, sorry, uh, wavelet, well, uh, okay. Let me repeat this by saying that um, this sparsity curve method can be used for any sparsity promoting method, including total variation, because that's sparsity in the gradient uh, of the image or it can be used for sparsity, for example, in a wavelet basis. So given the a priori information, for example, this kind of photographs, we can also compute the total variation norm of these guys, or more precisely, we can, we can calculate the number of neighboring pixels where there is a jump, giving giving a sparsity value, how sparse is the gradient in the, in the true uh, object. Then we can compute, I think this is, yeah, this is the total variation case. So we can compute with several alpha, we can compute the total variation reconstruction. And for each of them, see how many uh, jumps are there in the reconstruction. How sparse is the gradient of the reconstruction? And we get this curve because for larger alpha, we are approaching a, a constant reconstruction that would have no jumps. So somehow this uh, curve with alpha growing up, this curve should go to zero. And when we have, when alpha is small, uh, we have a lot of non-zero coefficients or a lot of jumps because the reconstruction is so noisy. But now somewhere in between, there should be a value of alpha that gives quite closely the a priori known value of sparsity. That's the idea of the S-curve. 
Any questions about the S curve method? Yep. Yes, I think in this case we didn't. I think we didn't compute the percentage. I think this may be the TV norm. Which is maybe not completely mm, So it may be maybe that this picture is not completely matching what I just said. Uh, that being that being uh, confessed, I would say that this computation could be done by uh, having the y-axis being just from zero percent to one hundred percent, and measuring how many uh, how many of the the neighboring pixels have a jump. Again, using some threshold what is considered to be zero and, and what is considered to be more than zero. And again, this is another approach that, that you can consider in, in the project work. If you are using total variation or wavelets, this kind of sparsity approach is, is quite, an, uh, quite a good option for choosing the regularization parameter. Yes. Yeah, I can, I can. So, if we are using sparsity promoting regularization, like for example, uh, wavelet sparsity, like we did, uh, which we know that uh, in the end the recon reconstruction will have uh, a large part of the coefficients exactly zero and a small part non-zero. That's the idea of sparsity. But also total variation can be seen as sparsity promoting because there in the total variation what we minimize in the penalty term there is the gradient of f and one norm. And this one norm promotes sparsity meaning that um, only in, in a subset of neighboring pixels in the reconstruction, there will really be a difference in the pixel values. So now if we are using a sparsity promoting reconstruction method, I think it's natural to think that also our a priori information is about sparsity. So we could think that we, we are in a situation that we, we know from our unknown target, we know the sparsity, how many wavelet coefficients are supposed to be non-zero. Such information maybe we can get from, from an atlas of images of true objects. Not exactly the one we are measuring, because that, that wouldn't be really the inverse problem, but maybe if we have similar objects available and we can analyze from there what is the expected level of sparsity. Then the idea of the uh, S-curve method is to find an alpha value, find a regularization parameter value that gives the expected sparsity. And how to do it is to draw this curve to choose many alpha values in the x-axis. For each of them, compute the reconstruction and from the reconstruction measure how sparse it is. And then put in the red curve uh, the value of sparsity for each alpha. Then you should get some kind of a curve Actually, in our uh, study, sometimes this curve is very erratic. Not as th this is a polynomial uh, interpolation curve to make it smooth, but actually, the curves can be uh, mm, let me see. Uh, yeah. Correct spot. Yes. Yeah. I wonder, did so we have it here? It doesn't matter if it's not like this or just the, the name of the image. Uh, 
No, the, the, this S doesn't uh, refer to the shape of the curve at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not S. In the L curve method, the L uh, is about the shape of the curve. In the S curve, it's not. And for example, here you see this is a wavelet-based reconstruction using the S curve method. And here you see we have quite a, a erratic, erratic curve here. And in, in the y-axis here, it's actually the absolute number of non-zero coefficients. We didn't compute the percentage. Uh, so we know a priori that this is how many non-zero wavelet coefficient we should expect and then we compute with so these little circles here show where we computed the values and then we put a polynomial interpolation between them uh, we didn't want to have so many values because uh, it's, a, it's a lot of computation and anyway it's quite erratic uh, so also with this method, which is also quite new, there are uh, open questions. How well does it work? Does it always work? How to pick, for example, if our sparsity level would be this here, we would have one, two, three matches. Which one to take? And there are questions like that. But anyway, it seems to work to some extent. And, well... Some, yeah, we collect some statistics of how much usually there is. Like, yes, yeah. I would say, yeah, it's, it's a statistical method in that sense. We, from some kind of a priori information, we have an expected value for the sparsity. And a good way to get that would be statistics. If we have, for example, for, for medical x-ray imaging, maybe we can access a, a hospital's database that has, let's say, thousands of CT images of persons. And, and we analyze the sparsity of all of them. And then we might work with very sparse data, uh, X-ray tomography. But then we know the sparsity from the really high resolution CT scans. And we can kind of bring that information over in the form of just one number. That's at least the idea behind this approach. OK. Oh, for this one, for this one, uh, it is, it is the uh, sum of absolute values of wavelet coefficients. I wonder if I can find it. Um, maybe it's more in the beginning. Here, so so this is the the data discrepancy term as usual, and then we have regularization parameter, and then we have just a sum uh, of absolute values of wavelet coefficients. The b minus one here means wavelet transform. So f is a function, and this b minus one. Um, I'm not sure why we use that notation, but anyway, that will compute the wavelet coefficients of f as a vector indexed by nu. And in this term, it's just the sum of absolute, so L1 norm of the wavelet coefficient vector. That's what it is. Okay, so we went through four different methods for regularization parameter choice. There are more, but these are four options anyway we saw today. And in the project work, this is one thing to think, uh, even in the first phase of your project, kind of think which method would you like to use. And you could kind of read a little bit about them and, and see if it appears suitable for your uh, target and data type and idea. Okay, thank you very much and see you next Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.